Hey everybody, how you doing? I am your host Adrian, I'm coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux Newslog is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. And for those of you who have, thank you so much for supporting the show. And with that, let's go ahead and get into the cool news for this episode. Starting off over at ZDNet, Linux still owns supercomputing. This is a story by Stephen J. Von Nichols. Once more, the best of the best supercomputer experts came together to decide which of the fastest of the fast computers. Number one with a bullet continues to be the Tianhe 2, a.k.a. Milky Way 2. It's a Chinese supercomputer developed by China's National University of Defense Technology. Its operating system, Linux, of course. Uh, so, you know, this has been a long-standing trend is Linux has, has been very dominant uh, in the, the supercomputing realm. And so it's just one of those things that probably won't change for quite some time to come. So pretty interesting article. Definitely uh, give it a read for sure. From InfoWorld, Four Ways Docker is remaking Linux. Red Hat, Ubuntu, SUSE, and Core OS are following different paths for adopting Docker and its virtualization technology. So uh, this basically is a rundown of, of you know, high level rundown of how each of those uh, distributions are adopting Docker technology in the distribution and how they plan to use it and that sort of thing. So definitely give this uh, a read if you're interested in uh, Docker or potentially maybe getting into Docker's uh, at work or just want to mess around with it or something of that nature. This uh, next story from LinuxGizmos.com I thought was pretty cool. Uh, Intel's Mica fashion bracelet features Linux and 3G data. Now, pretty neat. Uh, it's a lot like Apple's iWatch, except it runs Linux and it has 3G data. So Intel, an opening ceremony, uh, unveiled a $495 Linux-based Mica smart bracelet with 3G data, Facebook notifications, navigation, and intelligent reminders. Uh, Intel teased its MICA, which stands for My Intelligent Communication Accessory Bracelet, at the launch of the Edison module in September. Yet, while it is similarly based on Linux, the MICA appears to be too small to house the Edison. Uh, the MICA is co-designed by fashion, fashion Design House Opening Ceremony, which, along with Barney's, will begin selling the smart bracelet in early December, $495 via their retail and online venues. They have some pictures of it here, and, you know, I have to say, other than it being really flashy, it looks like a really thick bracelet. I don't know... Uh, almost like a pair of handcuffs. So, we'll see. Uh, obviously, it's aimed at, you know, people who have money and it is more jewelry than utilitarian or functional. So we'll see how that goes. From PR Newswire, SUSE Linux Enterprise Live Patching is now available. SUSE today announced the availability of SUSE Linux Enterprise Live Patching, allowing Enterprise Linux customers to perform system patching without rebooting, saving the cost of downtime and increasing service availability. So the live patching is based on the KGraft project. It provides a stream of packages to update a running kernel without interruption. In addition to increasing service availability by updating critical kernel patches without rebooting and reducing the need for planned downtime, planned downtime by patching frequently, SUSE Linux Enterprise Live Patching preserves security and stability by applying up-to-date patches. It's a fully open source solution that features zero interruption interaction with the system and a familiar deployment method. It's ideal for mission critical systems, in-memory databases, extended simulations, or quick fixes in a large server farm. This is pretty cool. Um, you know, live patching is one of those things, especially when you have to have a system that is up 99.999% of the time. Uh, you still have to be able to patch these things. I mean, it is software. 
So it's one of those things where it's like you really want to have that sort of functionality. Over at internetnews.com, Fedora Linux is set to abandon Firefox over an advertising issue. Uh, the recent Mozilla Firefox 33.1 browser release introduced what many in the open source and Linux communities consider to be a very distasteful feature. Namely, it includes an advertising feature by default. Got to support it somehow. That advertising comes on the new tab page and is on by default. How Mozilla can possibly justify such an epic failure of its principles is behind my own meager capacity to understand such a travesty. This is uh, Sean Michael Kerner, the author of this post. Not the only one that finds the new advertising abhorrent. Fedora Linux developers are also not keen on the new advertising and are likely to abandon Firefox as a result. So there's been a mailing list discussion on some Fedora lists. Developers are now actively debating dropping Firefox, even though the advertising issue doesn't technically make Firefox non-free. Uh, the challenge is that there isn't a good replacement, though developers are actively working on improving the GNOME Epiphany browser to replace the advertising-hungry Firefox. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, people like... To, I, I, I realize I'm probably taking a position that's less than popular, but... People like having their cake and eating it too. People don't like paying for software, but they want the software to be really super well supported and super high end. And the reality of the matter is that costs time. Yes, that costs time. And time is money. You know, it's either time and money uh, donated by developers or somebody needs to be paid to do it. You know, it costs time and money to make this software available. So, you know, yeah, you could expect them to do it by their good graces. But once something becomes popular to the point where it costs big money, guess what? You got to pay for it somehow. You can either charge the users or you can have advertising. It's that simple. I mean, this is <laughs> this is one of those things is just not that complicated. It's not rocket science. Anyway, uh. Interesting read, definitely check it out. Over at Linux Gizmos again, Tiny Mips Computer aims Linux and Android at wearables. This is pretty cool. Ingenics Tiny Newton 2 wearables module is smaller and more power efficient than the original, and it runs Linux or Android on a Mips based Ingenic M200 system on a chip. The Ingenic uh, Newton 2 provides a complete development platform for wearable and Internet of Things. According to Imagination Technologies, which announced the product to highlight the MIPS foundation of the Computer on Module's new Ingenic M200 processor. Compared to the original Newton announced earlier this year, however, the Newton 2 is focused even more directly on wearables than larger Internet of Things gizmos. Uh, it has shrunk from 38 by 22 by 3 millimeters to 30 by 15 by 2.4 millimeters, roughly half the size of the original Newton module, which is pretty remarkable. The Newton 2 also reduces power consumption to 150 milliwatts down from the 260 milliwatts of the previous version. Uh, standby powers also have uh, been cut in half to 2 milliwatts with uh, from 4 milliwatts if you don't have any radios activated or 3 milliwatts in a more typical standby state. Um, they've got some screenshots of the Newton 2, the original Newton, and the Edison modules shown to scale. It's pretty small. Definitely uh, check this out. So um, should be pretty interesting to see what comes of it. I'm, I'm curious to see what people are going to do with it. You know, it's this is one of those things where it's like you need to have, you know, a lot of, what Arduino enabled, it's like you really need to have some some good programmable functionality in a small form factor for a lot of things. From uh, GameAndGuide.com, Civilization Beyond Earth Mac and Linux update, mod support confirmed for Mac, multiplayer syncing issues still continue. Uh, Aspire, the Mac developer behind the Mac and Linux versions of Beyond Earth, has been keeping a dev diary going on the blog. Uh, definitely check it out, particularly if you're a player and you are playing it on Linux. Um, I thought I would uh, provide a link here for those of you who uh, are into that sort of thing. 
that will do it for this edition of Linux Newslog. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at uh, quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.